So, good morning. <laughs> it is. And welcome to uh, Golden Rod's Fly Time for today. Um, the first fly I'm going to tie is a, uh, oh, uh, again, I, I, I like these old patterns. And let me go on to spotlight here. I think I can do that. I don't know where we are. Where do I find that? Hmm. Let me go here. That wouldn't that hatch. That can ease not on the face. Uh, there we go. So you should be able to see me now. And just me. So this this is a kind of the kind of ratty version of it. I think it looks like kind of a ratty version fly anyway. And and so this is, is what we call an October caddis, but it's a nymph pattern. So I have another one here, which is it's a fairly basic uh, English style wet fly. Uh, and I'm going to tie it on a, a size 10 hook. Uh, I have uh, these Hannock short shank salt water and wet. It's a uh, barbless, so I don't need to pinch the barb. But it is a short shank, so we're going to be careful as to what we do with it to uh, keep it from being too bulky in the thor in the in the abdomen. So for this one, I'm going to use uh, a brown thread. Now the original pattern that I, I looked for was called a rusty brown. Uh, this is just straight brown. I couldn't find a rusty brown in my kit with a A dot. I'm going to start this back of the eye a bit because I don't want to crowd the eye with this guy. I'm just going to tie the thread on and just enough to make a, a starting spot. And then the next thing I need to do is the tail. And no, actually, sorry, the first thing I'm going to do is do the wire. This is going to have a wire wire rib, and it has a very fine, fine gold ultra wire or anybody's fine gold wire actually and just take a piece of that and I just put it on the near side of the hook and tied down with the wire trailing down the near side of the hook all the way back to the bend and the near side of the hook it, because when I do my first wrap with the wire as a rib, I'm going to wrap it from the underneath side, counter wrapped. So this keeps it out of the way for tying the tail and the rest of that stuff. Now, the next thing I'm going to use is put the tail on. And the tail also contributes to the body. And for that, I'm using marabou plume which is these little guys here that, that have the sort of the end of a, of a turkey butt feather. Um, and you can use either the side of the feather by picking off a few strands to make the tail and just pulling them off the side of the feather. Or you can, once you've used up all the sides, which I'm gonna do here, once you've used up the sides tying the first dozen or so, uh, you just end up with the plume like that. And I don't want too many fibers because I don't need a really fat tail. So I'm going to thin it down. And to handle this stuff so it doesn't get too unruly, a little bit of saliva doesn't hurt. I'll measure the tail to be the length of the shank of the hook from the bend to just the eye of the hook. And I'm gonna put that down right where the thread is and do a little pinch wrap. And another one. 
And then I'm going to hold up the tail and do a couple of wraps right behind. And all that does is that keeps the tail from collapsing down on the, the bend of the hook. Bring my thread in front of it and wrap the axe so it's going to start right, the body's going to start right where the tail is. I'll wrap right up the hook until I'm that two to two and a half to three eye lengths back of the hook shank, the, the hook eye. Now this is what's going to form the body of the fly, is this part of the, the marabou. And to do that, I will take my, one of these, a pair of hackle pliers. These are the little guys that are like a, an actually soldering clip. <laughs> Get rid of the butt end there. And then I spin it nice and tight. And you can see when I spin it, it makes like a, a little fuzzy body material. And I will wrap that up the hook shank. And every time I give a wrap, I have to give it another twist of, of material because if I don't, it tends to unwrap on every wrap. And you'll see it tapers a little bit. It starts from the back and gets a little fuzzier as, as it gets up front. Keep it tight. And when I get up to that part of the, again, if you use a longer shank hook, then you have to pick much longer marabou fibers. And that's where you'd use the longer fibers from uh, up the marabou plume. Trim that off there. I'm leaving a fair bit of space at the front here. And I'll tie that down. So I have this pudgy little body at the back. And if you use a longer shank hook, it'll be a little longer, but I kind of like this short stuff. And as I said before, I'll take my wire underneath the hook from there. And I will do three, maybe... Yeah, three, maybe four, but probably three on this short shank will do it. Wraps up the body. Try and space them reasonably evenly. And then when I get to that front of that, I'll just do a, an extra wrap in the front. And wrap over it. And back. And then trim the wire off. And have this these nice little pair of, of pliers, they're uh, they're a Pakistani product, and you'll see they have this little hook in here, this little which is perfect for cutting wire. You don't want to ruin the points of your scissors with uh, cutting that stuff. Okay, so the next thing we'll need, wherever it went, is my thorax. Oh, where'd it go? I have a, a little bit of what we have for the thorax is a little bit of what's called synthetic living fiber, SLF. And, and uh, Arizona makes it, uh, this is a Davy Wolton product. Uh, I'll use a little bit of this uh, similar size brown. It's kind of a off brown. I'll pull a little bit out of there. And I'm not going to need much, just a couple of inches. And I'm going to build a thorax by spinning that dubbing onto the, the th thread in a bit of a small dubbing rope. And all I'm going to make here is a, is a thorax that is uh, about the same size of the body, or because the body, this body is quite fuzzy. And I will wrap that in front of the body and make it just a little larger and fuzzier than the body. And I'm gonna try, and when I'm doing this, I'm gonna try and leave a little bit of a space at the front to put 
the hackle. So you see now I have a, a storch stubby body with a little bit of a different colored thorax. It's hard to see the colors in this light, but this is dark brown and this is kind of a light, light brown. You could probably put, use a little orangey brown if you have some. Um, and then I'm going to do the wing. Now this is a classic wet style wing. This is a pheasant, not a pheasant, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a uh, hen hackle. And you can see that it's fairly soft fibers and depending on where you pick the feather off of the, the neck, uh, it has longer or shorter fibers out from the stem. So I need to pick one that's got reasonable length fibers that are sort of shank length, maybe a little less. Um, so one in there. And I'll pull that off the, the hen. These things, when I first bought them, they were like 10 bucks for each one, cheap. And they have a lot of feathers. <laughs> you could use them forever. So to pre prepare the hackle, I'm just going to take where the fuzz goes and I'm going to pull off one side, all of the stuff down to the tip, turn the feather over. Do the same thing on the other side. Do this gently or you actually can break the hackle stem. But if you do it right, it'll take all the fuzz off the hackle stem. And it's going to take the last bit. And I need the end of the hackle stem to tie this in. So there's your, there's your feather that's going to be the hackle. Now I've used that particular hen. I've got a couple of different ones that I could, could use. Uh, but, but I like the color of this guy. It's kind of a dark mottled color. I'm going to hold it by the tip and gently stroke the hen hackle backwards. And when I get to where I think enough to get at the most three wraps maybe of hackle around the shank, I will turn this feather around, take my scissors, and I will get close to the, where the feathers are pulled back, the barbs are pulled back. And I'll trip them so I've got this little triangular piece left over. I will lay that on the near side of the hook, right behind the eye, and wrap over top. And that little piece of stem and feather is what keeps the feather from being pulled out while you wrap the hackle. And I've got the, the nice colored part or the darker colored part facing me when I tie it on onto the hook shank. Uh, because when I wrap it, I want all of the barbules of that hackle to face to the back. Now I'm gonna take my uh, regular hackle pliers. And this is, a, if you wanna tie good English wets, this is a technique you need to learn. <laughs> so what I do is I hold this stem straight up, wet my fingers with a little saliva and train the fibers back. This is called folding the hackle. And you'll see you've got a little bit of a, a fold there around the stem on either side. As I wrap, I'm going to try and hold those back towards the back. And I'll need to twist the hackle just a little bit to make sure they keep doing that. They keep facing backwards. The fold keeps facing backwards. And I will one, two. I might get a third one. One, two. Yeah, I get one more. Again, keep keep folding them back. And then finally up, a couple of, are not cooperating here. There we go. So I got all those things folded back and facing the backward way. Come over the top. Two times. Then pull the stem back and wrap right in front of the eye. 
right behind the eye. And then I can cut the stem off. Cut my fingers and pull all this stuff straight back. And I will put a little head on this fly. What the head does is it, it forces the hackle fibers to the back. So it's they're not sticking straight out to the side. They kind of fold it to the back. And then I will finish. I do too, so I don't need to use glue. And in here with my scissors and put it up against the thread and cut, cut, cut. There you go. So there he is. That is the October caddis wet fly. And apparently this is this is the emerging caddis, uh, and it tends to take its time getting up from the bottom, bouncing off the rocks and stuff. And uh, traditional English wet. If you can tie that one, you can tie a whole raft of English wet flies because the techniques are pretty much the same. So there you go. Any comments? Questions? You're being very quiet here. <laughs> uh, no. How, uh, so how do you fish this? You just swing it? Yep. You swing it and, and do a slow retrieve towards shoreline, I guess. Uh, you, you, this is something, I, I, this is a, you, these caddis are quite small in the fall and they're quite dark. Uh, and you, the, what I was reading a little bit on it and, and the, the guy said, what you should want to do is to have it bounce in, in amongst the rocks and the reeds and stuff like that as you're retrieving it. So you want to keep it on the bottom. Uh, so that the main thing I taught this is, is did this one is because it gives you all those traditional English wet fly techniques as to how to deal with creating bodies and doing wrapping and and uh, and particularly the wet fly hackles. You do this with a partridge and orange and uh, a lot of similar spider style wet flies that uh, the English really like, <clears throat> and they tend to be pond fishermen. A lot of those guys so. It could be a, an equally good lake fly as it is a stream fly. Yeah, actually, the October caddis I'm familiar with is a is a bigger is a bigger. There is a big one too. Yeah, that that's certainly in in the prairies. I wouldn't be surprised. That I don't. I, I can't. This is from an English flying tra fly tradition, so it's probably maybe a smaller one there in October. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what the couch and what the size the ones are in the couch and because that's where we're mostly going to find these caddisflies, late caddisflies over the place like the cow. So, wouldn't the wouldn't the lakes around there have some uh, some um, caddis flies I would, coming out? I would think I I don't I haven't been up at places like Durant's at this time of year often enough to to see what's coming off the water so. It's entirely possible. Mm. So that's him. That's stuff up the way. So the next one is again. I've opted for a uh, an old older style fly. This this one is from the forties, and it's called a sofa pillow. Uh, in getting prep, I tied a few of these, but. A couple of different sizes. So this is a, a six and this is an eight. This is a uh, must add 9672, which is basically a, a almost a 4X long shank. And this is a 9671, which is a, a 3X long shank. Uh, so you could tie them in either size. Um, this is actually like a stone fly imitation. And the reason I wanted to do this one is Every evening, my wife and I go down to the beach at Cabra Bay to look for the seven o'clock seal. 
<laughs> and you laugh. You might laugh, but there is a seal that shows up at about that time of day in the in the bay. And at that time of, of day, there's there's no more uh, paddle boarders out, and the the sailors have come in, and the uh, nobody's trying to swim in the cold water. Uh, so he comes out, and he sort of goes back and forth across the front of the bay, probably picking up the little fathead minnows and stuff that are in there. So we go down to look for the seven o'clock seal every day. And I noticed uh, that this time of year, there's a stonefly that comes off about that time. And it's about, it's sort of in between this size. It's, it's probably closer to the, this, this size. It's a relatively small stonefly. And it does have a reddish body. You see him flying around just off the beach. <clears throat> and I suspect what it is, there's some, uh, there's a stormwater uh, outfall not far from, from where the, the main part of the beach is. And uh, there's a stream that comes down from the university uh, through Mystic Vale. Uh, and it comes down and flows into the pond near my brother-in-law's place. And some of it goes direct into the, into the ocean. But there's another braid of it that comes off of there that comes through the the district next to us and ends up on our side of the the park goes through a little swale and then around and it goes into this uh, sort of sluey area before it hits the storm outfall into the bay and i think what's happening there is in some of in the pond and in some of the slack water there there are some small stoneflies that show up at this time of year so i'm going to tie a pattern that will imitate that and i'm going to use a, the short i'll do the short shank one because it's, i like this it's more the size of the stonefly that's down there uh, i think a size eight maybe a 3x long would be would be fun so i have my mustad hooks in this box uh this is a barbed hook so i will take the barb off First, if you don't have them, for those who want to remove barbs, getting a pair of pliers that are flat on the jaws with no serrations keeps from damaging the hook when you're pinching the barb. And that works pretty well. So I put that in the, in the vise, nice and tight, so it's good and solid. Now, apparently, in the mailed out directions, I missed the first part of the pattern. So I'm going to use uh, eight dot black thread here. Eight dot black for the thread. The tail is this guy, which is a, this is, this is goose shoulder, but you can use a, a standard goose wing quill that's dyed red. And a lot of the, again, these early, flies like that red tag and there were a lot of flies that tied with a red tag on them so that's what this is Hi, Freeman. and it so it comes right off of this quill so you can see i've been hacking at these a bit <clears throat> once again i will start i'm going to start well back of the eye because we're going to have hackles up at the well, maybe let me start at that. Sorry, let's start at the eye. And I need to loosen the tension on my thread. It's the nice thing about these right bobbins is you can uh, you can adjust the tension on them pretty well. And start a little bit behind the eye. And well, aha, now I know why it's t tight. It was wrapped around the leg of the bobbin. So let's just uh, unwrap that. There we go. So let's try again. So a little bit behind the eye. And I will wrap down the shank of the hook.
and then I'll trim off the thread and finish up by wrapping the thread down right to the bend. And where the bend is, I want this tail to stick up a little bit. So I'm gonna make a, a little bump of thread here, right at the bend. So you can see that it's a little bit, little bit bulkier there. And I'll put the thread right in front of the bump and get a slip of, of this uh, nice red feather off of this quill. And I'm gonna cut it probably a little less than gap width section of the quill. You see it has a really nice curved shape to it. What I'll do is I, I want the tail to be kind of gap behind the bend of the hook. So I, I measure from, from where the point is and get a gap width and stick it back where that, uh, that bump is and where my thread's hanging. And I'll come up in between my fingers and do a classic pinch wrap down the far side. Just give a slight tug, don't pull down, bring it up to the near side and then pinch my fingers snug and pull up. And when I do that, from here on, I will make my next wrap in front of that. A couple of wraps to tie it down. And you'll see how that nice little tail keeps together. It doesn't separate and it sticks up. And that is the beauty of doing a pinch wrap like that, pulling it up in between your fingers, down the far side and then underneath and then pulling up. What that does is that keeps that quill together and it, the bump stands it up a little bit. So it sticks up in the air a bit. Now I'm gonna bring my thread right up here to where I first tied it on. I, I wanna leave a good three eye widths behind the eye for putting the hackle on, because this is a bulky hackle fly. And the next thing I want to do is do the body, which is just red floss, a standard, red floss um, and I'll get a good chunk out here hey Florin I, I had I had a bunch of your your spool keepers but I've stored them away somewhere and I can't figure out where I stored them <laughs> so you're just gonna have to make a few more that's all yeah I, I, they're out in the garage somewhere so I'm gonna put this down on the thread and on the hook shank. And again, a quick little wrap or two, not really tight. And then I'll, rather than trimming it off, I'll just pull it back. And then I'm gonna leave my thread hang again, about that three or four eye widths behind the hook shank. Bring my thread forward. So that's where it's tied in. And I'm gonna do a half hitch here right behind the eye, do it right behind the eye. Bring my bobbin rest around. It makes doing this body a whole lot easier when you do that. I'll stretch this uh, floss out and I'll start wrapping towards the back. Now, one of the things when you're doing this wrap, the, the, the flat thread tends to untwist so every so often I'm gonna to have to do a twist, clockwise twist to keep it from separating too much. And you'll see that it does tend to separate a little bit because it's untwisted floss. And I just, every once in a while I have to snug it up again or it separates out into multiple strands. When I get back to that tail, I will then re go back up the hook shank. What this does is this gives you a nice thickness body, nice and smooth. 
that uh, it's not too thick. Now, when I get here, I'm going to make a little extra wrap or two of the floss because when I tie the the wing in, I'm going to want that floss to be a little tapered. Bring the thread back and tie it down right there. Trim them off. So that's it. Red floss. So that's the body of the fly. The next part is natural squirrel tail. Now, <laughs> around my house, the natural squirrels at, at this time of year, they get mange. <laughs> and their, their tails, you wouldn't want one of their tails because they're, they're pretty mangy tails. Uh, so you need to find a, 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 a squirrel tail that's got a reasonable length and, and a fair number of fibers. The, the squirrels around here right now, they look like somebody's been picking the tail apart. Um, so anyway, I got got natural squirrel tan. It's got a really nice mix of of brown and and uh, and black. So I'm gonna take a uh, a section of this stuff right right at the quill, and and again I'll look measure that against the shank of the, at the gap of the hook, and I, I'm gonna want it if it's laying flat about gap width the tail. And I will come down and I will cut it right at the bone of the tail. So I can start with a nice long chunk of wing. I don't need to stack this. It's uh, it's it's tips are, are a little ragged, which is okay. And I want the tail to extend no the the wing to extend no more than where the tail is. So I'm gonna tie it in about there and I'll need to trim it really short on the front so that I can tie it down. So I'm just doing it over the waste basket here so I don't end up with squirrel tail all over the carpet here, living room. So there you go. That's my tail. That's a little long actually at the front. Cut that short again. So I only want the about the where I'm tying it in. I only want enough to cover up from where the thread is to where the floss finishes it again with a little bit of gap in front of the thread to the eye. And I will right at the back of this last little lump. I'm going to tie the tail, the wing in, and snick it back. I still want to leave this gap at the front because I'm going to have a very bulky hackle. On the bigger flies, the the pattern that I looked at uh, actually used more than one hackle. And, and I may end up doing that depending on which hackles I choose. So when I get there, I'm going to pull that wing straight up and wrap in behind it several times. What I want to do is build just a little bit of a bulb of thread behind that tie end point. And that causes the wing to sit up off the body. So there you go. Now, I will try to make this a little bit smoother going up to the eye of the hook. So that when I wrap hackles, they're not going to trip funny. Twist funny. Okay, right back to the where it's tie in point. And hackle. So it says saddle. These are actually necks, but they're they're fairly long. So they have a reasonable length of, of hackle that is relatively even length. Uh, difference between saddles and, and necks is for those who don't know, 
is that neck hackles are the barbules have a tapered shape where they're much shorter barbules at the tip than they are at the tie-in point. Whereas saddle hackles tend to have the same length of barbules along most of the length of the 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 vibe, the, tail, the stem. Uh, but if you get a nice a nice neck like this guy here, it's not too badly tapered. Uh, I'll select a couple of feathers. That one was is a furnace hackle. This one's just a straight brown, so I'm going to mix them just for fun. Um, and I want the, the barbules to be, that's a little long. I want the barbules just to be a little more than the gap of the hook. So that's probably not bad. So I'm gonna pull that one off. And I'll just gently stroke these back because I want the usable part of the hackle. Uh, I'm probably gonna get three or four wraps out of this hackle. And I want the barbules to be, again, about gap width. So we'll trip, trim the bottom of the hackle off, the stuff that is really long and fuzzy. And again, to keep this stem from pulling out, I turn it sideways and on either side of the stem, I'm gonna just clip about an eighth of an inch so I can see what I'm doing. just on either side of the stem. And so you see, I got a little bits of stem sticking out there that the front that has some uh, fuzzy bits sticking out the side. And what that does is when I cinch that down on the, on the hook, it's gonna keep that hackle from pulling out. I take the uh, intensely colored part of the hackle and face it away from me, because when I wrap this, I want the, the barbules to wrap up facing slightly forward. I'm gonna tie that in right on the side there. Bring my thread back to the same place. And I'm gonna select one of these furnace hackles that's a little darker core. And I'm gonna do two, tack two hackles. That one's pretty long, I have to come down in here. I'm only gonna get like three, maybe three wraps of this guy. So I'll pull this one out. You see these furnace hackles, they have a, a center that's dark and the, and the outer part is lighter color. And I want some of that dark color. So I'm gonna look, yeah, that's about the right length. So trim that off. And do the same thing to this as I did to the other one. I'm going to just go on either side of the stem and trim a little bit of hackle off. So that you end up with a few barbules sticking out. So again, the intensely colored side facing away from me, tied on the near side of the hook. And those little barbules and that little short piece of stem will cause that hackle to not pull up when I tie it down. Now I'm gonna bring my thread right down to the front, make sure I have a nice smooth part of thread there to wrap the hackle around. Take my conventional Griffin hackle pliers and I will wrap the second hackle I tied in first. And I will do two or three wraps right down to the front to where my thread's hanging. And put the thread through a couple of times. And then a couple in front. Trim that guy off. And take my hack flyers and do the next one. 
And I wiggle the second one as I wrap it through the first one. I will wiggle it so I don't trap any of the fibers of the first hackle. And try to keep, that's the beauty of these Griffin hackle pliers is that the head twists as we do this so that they keep the curved part of the hackle facing forward as I wrap through. So you see, this is a really fuzzy hackle when I'm done. I bring it up and tie through there. And wrap in front. Can get the stem out. And make this uh, little wet fingers and pull the hackle fibers back from the eye. And then I can get in here and make a nice little head. That keeps the eye clear of hackle fibers so that uh, I don't get it gooed up when I try to run the tip it in. Once again, I'll just tie two whip finishes and that way I won't need glue. Yeah. And and trim off the thread. And there you go. And there's two straight hackle fibers at the front here that got trapped with the wood finish. Trim those off. And that's him. That is your 1940s sofa pillow. Now, when these uh, stoneflies are flying around, they, they they look like almost like a butterfly. They have because they have pairs of wings, they flutter a lot. But the minute that they land, they go flat straight back. Uh, so this is intended to be fished as a kind of a dry fly on the surface. And now I can stop the, uh, I can find it here. Oops, quit that. Um, if I can find the, remove spotlight. There we go. So that's him. Very nice, thanks. You can you can actually turn off the recording too. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Where are we here? Yeah, it's gotta be. I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs>